What do you take away from last night's game, Cody? DeMar DeRozan was awesome. Yes, he was. Absolutely spectacular. I mean, you look at that game and it feels like Giannis is dominating, obviously, and he did with the 45 points. But um, you don't realize that the Bulls, the Bulls don't have a shot at all without everything DeMar did in every aspect. And that wasn't just the 42 points. I mean, we're looking at the charge he took on Giannis with about five minutes left in regulation that really turned the momentum a little bit. Just it felt like if Giannis had gotten the three-point play after it was reviewed and, and challenged by Billy Donovan, if the Bulls hadn't gotten that call, that the game's probably over. And then you go to overtime, the Bulls scored 13 points, and he had 10 of them. And he drew the defense to throw the ball to Vooch for the other three on a, on a three-pointer. And just an absolutely amazing performance by him to pull out a victory that the Bulls probably shouldn't have had any time you trail by 11 in the final minutes. Am I making too much of the fact that there were moments in that, that comeback and win where it felt like Zach had disappeared? Yeah, or making too much of it? Yeah, because I, I, I was watching him like, I'm glad that DeMar's doing his thing. Vooch came up with a really big shot at the end, but I'm sitting there like, where's Zach in this? Yeah, he... I was thinking, I'd have to go back, and we were talking about this, the beat writers after the game. I'd have to go back and look, but, like, I can't remember how many times he touched the ball in overtime, right? Like, it was going through DeMar the whole time. They left Pat Williams open for a couple threes and, and moved the ball there. But I, I don't think I don't think it's a big deal because DeMar was on such a heater and it was so obvious that it would have been ill-advised to me if the Bulls would have forced the ball to Zach Levine when DeMar was in such a rhythm, right? And they were getting the good shots on the possessions that DeMar didn't shoot, right? Like, Vooch got the good look. Patrick Williams got a couple open looks uh, in overtime out of that. So, Zach, Zach hit the three, I think, to pull the Bulls within six with about two minutes left. I think he got the free throw line there. He drove to the hoop, had the pass to DeMar for the layup that cut it to two. So he was involved late in regulation, certainly. But in overtime, it was the DeMar show. It was the DeMar show on one end. It was the Giannis show on the other end. One of those two guys made more shots. And I think Giannis was probably, he was spent, man. Like, I, I just think he expended so much energy. I think he shot one of eight in overtime and like three or four of those were short um, on his jump shot. I do feel like as good as DeMar was in the extra frame that the Bulls also were slow out of the gate. Like, some some yeah. really good defense helped put them back in. Turnover-minded defense. Well, they were still, I mean, they were down four and didn't have the ball, and overtime was half over, right? Right. Like there's, there's a thousand possessions in NBA games. Um, so that's certainly always a surmountable thing. But, like, it was a bad start in overtime, certainly. Um, when they, they left P. Will open, I think P. Will had one drive to the hoop that was a little ill-advised in overtime when he shouldn't have gone. I think he went at Giannis and, and kind of forced a shot. But... The Bulls showed you something last night in the sense that, that they aren't going to quit, which is weird to say because it feels like sometimes they quit at the start of games against bad teams. If you guys, as you guys have been detailed, 18 uh, uh, points in less than five morning, minutes against were, the Rockets. They, don't they were down start, 23 to five. Like, they, hey, the there's a team on the court. They're going to do things. They don't start the engine early enough there, but Billy's um, boys don't quit. Except this. Start. Ricky Renneria would be so proud. So proud. Just kept fighting like Zach Levine said. And no makes quitting. a mean queso. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought I thought the game mattered in the sense of, I thought from a strategical standpoint, the Bulls figured it out as the game went along. Like Grayson Allen, public enemy number one here, had three or four shots that could have put the Bulls away wide open. And the Bulls were like, hey, Giannis isn't going to beat us in the final five or six minutes of this game. Like He's going to get his points, but someone else is going to have to beat us. No one on the Bucks did late in regulation. No one on the Bucks certainly did. Um, in overtime when Giannis shot most all the buck shots, certainly. But stylistically, they said someone else has to beat us on a night Middleton and Holiday are out, and the Bucks couldn't do that. I mean, that's it to me. Is is I've seen that philosophy work for a lot of teams where they're like, okay, we're going to let that guy get his. But he got his at an extraordinary rate for him to have 45 and 22. That's one of his best regular season games ever. And I didn't think the Bulls played him that bad, right? Like, Two of his shots in the first quarter or first half were just wild bounces where the ball bounced to Giannis right at the rim off loose balls that the Bulls were hustling for, and he got dunks, right? And then he does the thing where he just barrels into you and creates space, and then what he does is he has the length and explosiveness to whatever small margin of space he has, it's over. Like, that's what he does. I thought P. Will most of the night did a good job being on him body to body, 
taking those hits. I thought the places where the Bulls did a poor job on Giannis was when you saw it a few times. Io DeSumo wasn't helping like right at free throw line level. So Giannis would hit P will and then there's lots of space. Then he just goes around and, and dunks or makes a layup. Like that second guy has to be there. And there are stretches in the middle of the game, second half where they didn't do a good enough job, whether it was Io, Zach, DeMar, these wing defenders. Once the Bulls got that locked in, like the last play of regulation for the Bucks, I thought was fascinating, right? Like mm-hmm. three Bulls right on Giannis. I think Javante Green and DeMar on either side after P. Wills, obviously in the middle playing him heads up one-on-one. And then forced to travel and you're like, is it a travel? Like, are they going to call it? Well, it's a travel, but it was a huge play because George Hill was wide open under the hoop if Giannis had kept his pivot foot. And it could be a different discussion if the Bucks make a game-winning layup at the buzzer. And just the simple fundamental of, of like birch tree defense just stick your arms up and hope the arms do something and it's wild it never ceases to amaze me how often that yeah and it's interesting right so like Giannis is probably the I mean hardest person in the NBA from a physical standpoint to defend we were talking about his refereeing as well yeah and the Bulls again he went for 45 he was great but the Bulls I mean, they made it as hard as they could. And again, I didn't think there were like systemic breakdowns in their defense. It's just tip your hat to Giannis. But the Bulls can handle one athletic guy, but you send five out there and you get overwhelmed sometimes, like you said, these younger, more athletic teams. Then it is like a culture shock or a system shock for the Bulls. And they get in some trouble when they face those teams um, in that sense. And if Holiday and Middleton were out there with more talent and... And better athleticism, it probably would have been a bigger problem, no doubt. Cody, you watch every team that comes into town. You've seen the entire league. You have been covering the Bulls for a while, and you talk to people all over the place. What is the challenge of refereeing Giannis? Oh, I mean, it's the reason it's so difficult is because there's so much contact every play, and you're trying to decide, did he do anything illegal to create that? Is it incidental and... Both people are fine and play on. Or did he have an advantage and the defender was out of space? And then, like, Giannis, the other thing, it's kind of like soccer, right? The World Cup just ended. There are going to be times when Giannis is fouled and it's better for the Bucks if you just let him play on and dunk rather than calling a blocking foul because he's so big and huge and they'd probably rather have that dunk than have a side out of bounds, you know, um, in some cases there. So uh, that's why it's so difficult. It's He's totally different from, I mean, you think back years ago to Shaq a couple decades ago. He's so hard because he's on the block and his back's to the basket. Giannis's back isn't to the basket. I mean, he's a seven-foot point guard who does not have superb dribbling ability, but good enough to get to the hoop consistently again and again and be confident in it. And then he's got the spin move back into the lane if he goes left and wants to spin right or vice versa. So uh, it's just a, it's just a situation where there's so much contact every single play. You can't call it every single time, and you're trying to decipher who was in the right and wrong for whatever small advantage was earned at that point. It is really funny that Brooke Lopez and the spacing still somehow works out to where we're having this conversation. Like even that is something to appreciate about that team well yeah the bucks do such a good job spreading the floor right when they're fully healthy and i mean they didn't shoot three pointers well at all last night just checking there at nine of 44 is just abysmal for them and grayson a, allen was abysmal from three-point range a good but, reason the bulls won but they and open I hope up they the middle that. they open up the middle for Giannis time and time and time again um and that's what they do so um again good win for the bulls five and one now i think against the east top three teams in the celtics Nets and certainly the Bucks here, they're 2-0 uh, against them with a home win and a road win. So you see you see the the silver lining a little bit for the Bulls, but at the same time, um, it's just it's got to be every night, and that's the question. And Billy Donovan was talking about it before the game started last night. Like He was putting the blame on himself for not having the Bulls ready for the Rockets from the standpoint of his message wanted to be, we can't overlook them. And he said that. But apparently he thought he should have devoted far more time and shoot around. I don't know if he wanted to keep them for an extra 20 minutes after the bell rang or something to just keep pounding that um, into their heads. But I I felt like that more for Billy last night saying that, trying to take blame for the loss of the Rockets retroactively two days later. I thought that was just kind of coach speak, and it didn't have a lot of meaning to me because I put it more on the players to not overlook someone, right? Like Mm -hmm. if there was something in the game plan that had been a disaster in that game, um, then I think you would pinpoint it on the coaching staff more. And I felt like it was more the team being flat-footed on that Monday night game. And they responded like you want them to on Wednesday with the win against the Bucs.
What was the reaction to Grayson Allen inside the Bulls locker room? Um, I would not say anger. I would say annoyed is probably the best way uh, to recap that. Zach Levine just kind of, he mentioned the track record. Billy Donovan mentioned the track record. They were kind of exasperated by the play and having to deal with it again. No one was like, that's a dirty play. Like, they were far more fired up about the Alex Caruso play, obviously, last year, because that was a dirty play. This was an exaggerated play that was annoying to get an elbow into the side of you or your back. Um, but that was not... The play last night with Grayson Allen, I did not think was that big of a deal, personally. The Bulls, and when you're involved in it, are going to think it's a little bit bigger of a deal. But it was not, like, headline-worthy, they're mad, and now it's all over national headlines type thing, like the one last year, certainly. So, um... They're just, they're really tired of the guy. They're annoyed by him. They don't like him. Uh, and DeMar pretty much said it. It wasn't the play and like him thinking he was hurt and it was dirty as much as it was the person. Um, and because he mentioned the track record a little bit too. Um, and the surprise of the play kind of getting elbowed there. So it's like you said, I mean, you've played this, talked about it for the first hour. Like Derek Jones Jr. put out really hard foul on Grayson Allen last year. DeMar confronted him. So, like, to me, it's like the Bulls are doing what they need to do without going too far. Like, you don't need to do something that gets guys suspended on your team. I don't think that's going to be helpful for the Bulls. I thought the, the hard foul by Derek Jones Jr. last year I thought was perfect, right? Like, that's the guy who should be doing it. A guy in the rotation. But, like, Zach and DeMar shouldn't be going out there picking up a foul, flagrant foul, stuff like that. Don't um, get so, your hands dirty. So, I thought, I thought DeMar handled it well. He confronted him. And then he went out there and lit the bucks up for the third quarter, the fourth quarter. Uh, in overtime. So um, really annoyed, but I wouldn't say like running through the wall angry or anything this time.